friends, fellow Earthlings, and maybe hopeful explorers of potentially habitable worlds out there. Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that seeks to celebrate the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Lau, also known online now as Space Beard, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Seganet.org. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't know of any exoplanets, for sure. We had ideas that there were worlds out there, but it wasn't until the early 90s that we first started detecting worlds around other stars, and now we know of thousands of exoplanets out there. And now we can also start asking questions about whether some of those worlds are habitable or could be inhabited by life as we know it. And so we have a very special guest for today's episode to explore some of those kinds of questions with us and to share his work in this realm of habitable worlds out there. Now, before I introduce our wonderful guest, we have a little housekeeping to do. As always, we like to point out those of you out there who are sharing about our show, sharing about our wonderful astrobiologist guests, uh, getting involved in the conversation with them about their research and the things they do. And this month, we have to give a shout out to the reigning uh, ambassador for the show, Denise, at AstrobioDNZ on Twitter. Uh, Denise is a master's student in molecular biology and evolution at the University of Kiel, uh, she's shared many times about our show and has gotten involved in the conversation. So, Denise, thank you very much for being involved in Ask an Astrobiologist. Now, that said, I get to introduce our guest, Professor Abel Mendez. Professor Mendez is a planetary astrobiologist and the director of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo. His research focuses on the habitability of Earth uh, the worlds of our solar system, and some of those worlds out there around other stars. Uh, he's been a NASA Mears Fellow uh, in Physics and Astrophysics and has research experience at Fermilab, NASA Goddard, NASA Ames, and with the Arecibo Observatory. Uh, so, Professor Abdel Mendez, uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist. Hello, thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here with all of you. It's so great to have you join us. I think a lot of our audience might know you the best from Twitter, uh, at Prof Abel Mendez, where you share a lot of news about astrobiology and planetary science. Uh, I think a lot of folks follow you just to get that good hit of astrobiology news every day, but maybe they don't know as much about your research. So I'd like to start off with you just talking a little bit about what, what really got you into your career field. What inspired you as a child to pursue a career in planetary astrobiology? Well, I always loved astronomy and the idea of extraterrestrial life in the universe. I grew up watching Star Trek and the Cosmos television series by Carl Sagan. I had a telescope and a computer since I was 10 years old. I had a wonderful view of the night sky from my home back in then in rural Puerto Rico. There were so many street, there were not that many street lights back then, so I was able to appreciate our galaxy, the Milky Way. I contemplated the stars and planets almost every night. I took notes and wrote code in basic computer language to predict the position of planets back then. As soon as I learned about the Arecibo Observatory, I asked my parents to visit the observatory. We went even below the dish in Egypt, in Egypt on my first visit. I had a blast that day. I met many scientists there, and they were eager to talk to me about their research at the observatory. And I was just 12 years old. The observatory reinforced my interest in astronomy, and I was very curious about the Arecibo message. Our first big attempt to send a message to other civilization, if there's anybody listening out there. So I decided to study physics against the recommendations of many of my friends. They say that I should do engineering instead because that's where the money is. I decided for my passion and never look back. I did a bachelor and master in theoretical physics at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, my university didn't have an astronomy program, so I took as many courses in astronomy, mathematics, and computer science as possible. During graduate school, I selected a thesis project in biophysics because it was very interesting. I had a lot of computational work. That was my first big connection with biology. I also participated back then of many physics and planetary research programs for students at NASA and Goddard and NASA Ames. I started 
teaching position at the University of Puerto Rico in Arecibo in 1996. My campus is about 30 minutes from the observatory. It was back then that I had the freedom to conduct my own research topic, and I decided to take back my passion for the idea of extraterrestrial life in the universe. Uh, that year was announced the discovery of the Martian meteorite with potential fossils. So that was another thing that probably motivated me more. I went to one to the early astrobiology school to train myself more in astrobiology field. In 2000, NASA had its first astrobiology science conference at PsyCon, and I was there. Uh, there were not that many Hispanic persons back then, and I was the only person from Puerto Rico there. I was particularly interested in the concept of habitability, how we can measure how good or bad an environment is for life. I had two very influential books early on in the field. I love this book, An Introduction to Environmental uh, Biophysics by Campbell and Norma, 1998. Uh, I, I not only read this book, but I also solve all his practice problems. It's full of equations describing biophysical principles. And uh, you, can very, uh, you can very well call this book Habitability, Physical Factors. I also like the natural selection of the chemical elements by William and Frausto da Silva, 1996. You can call this book Habitability, Now the Chemical Factors. And for astronomy, I love Physics and Chemistry of the Solar System by Lewis, 1997. So this Three books are probably the most influential ones early on. Through all my career, my computers got smaller and the telescope got bigger. <laughs> I, I love that concept. <laughs> computers get smaller, the telescope gets bigger, um, which is really important. I, I do want to talk at length about Arecibo with you um, in a bit. But, but first, um, so you are a professor uh, at UPR Arecibo. Um, I wonder if you could tell uh, our audience about the things you teach and maybe even your vision for the future of students studying with you uh, from Puerto Rico. Yes, I started in 2010 our Planetary Habitability Laboratory. This is a, a, a research and educational laboratory, uh, especially to do theoretical work about understanding habitability from the solar system and exoplanet. And I'm part of this uh, project. We train students in research, and we have also a astrobiology course for, for our students. So right now we have about 30 students, three graduates, and uh, the rest are undergraduates involved in different projects uh, regarding uh, astronomy through biology. That's fantastic. And so uh, can you tell us uh, about the Planetary Habitability Laboratory? Um, what are some of the primary missions and objectives um, through PHL? Uh, uh, you know, what, what are you trying to develop uh, through the PHL? Yes, we want to. We started this project uh, because there are, uh, back then in the early days of astrobiology, we noticed that there were many misconceptions, even until today, about habitability. For example, that we can define, that we cannot define habitability because it's very abstract concept, that we cannot quantify it because it's too complicated, or that we cannot assess the habitability of faraway worlds because we don't know all the details of the environment. So I started asking myself about how to define and measure habitability. So that's the main uh, problem around 20 years ago in the early days of the astrobiology field. I started by looking for a definition, including beyond the astrobiology field. I, don't found, I found that most dictionary definitions were associated to human habitation. Habitability is associated to human habitation. This, this topic seemed important enough disabling a whole chapter in biology, but to my surprise, the words habitable and habitability were not generally present in biology textbooks. Therefore, I thought that, like everybody else, that the topic of habitability was a new problem or question in biology brought by the astrobiology field, that the biological concept of habitability was exclusively an astrobiology topic. But the first astrobiology paper to directly address how to quantify 
Habitability was published by Chuck and Holland in Astrobiology in 2007. They suggest using the available power for life or energy per time as the best proxy to quantify habitability. A paper around that time by Tori Holler for NASA Ames also concurred with using energy to quantify habitability. I was fascinated with this idea, but not totally convinced it was the final solution. Then in around 2009, I found something that changed everything for me. I found a, a 1993 paper by Rice and others, not related to astrobiology at all, but using the word habitability to refer to the quality of a semi-arid land for some type of birds. The paper also pointed that their model was consistent with the habitat suitability index used in ecology. I searched for that phrase, habitat suitability, and went to the source, and I was overblown. I finally realized that what astrobiologists call habitability as a new problem was actually an old problem called, called habitat suitability in biology. In the late 1970s, ecologists were using different measures of uh, habitability uh, or the or habitat quality, not all consistent between them. Same problem with astrobiologists are having today. Then in 1980, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided to fix this and create a standard this, uh, description of habitability, or a white paper, which they call the habitat suitability in this mode. I then realized that the problem of defining and quantifying habitability was already solved by biologists. We recently published a paper, Habitat uh, 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 Habitability Model for Astrobiology, describing how the astrobiological field can incorporate the ecological, ecological definition of habitability. So let's formalize some basic, basic concepts of habitability. Habitability is defined as the suitability of an environment for life. It is proportional to carrying capacity. This is a key word in biology, which is the maximum stable biomass that an environment can sustain. This is how they quantify habitability in bio uh, biology. Habitability is used to determine how a set of environmental factors impact life, their presence or abundance. The key thing here is about this term is that the set of environmental factors are not necessarily the only important ones, but the ones you want to understand how significant or not they are for life. And everybody thinking about what all the factors that we need to combine. No, no, you, you do habitability by parts. You want to understand a set of factors at a time. And I love the classical elements analogy for the requirements of life. Life needs the classical ele elements, air, water, earth, and fire, and more correctly, a gas, liquid, solid, and some energy. One of the reasons is that the elements necessary for DNA and other biogenic elements are not available in a single state of matter. So you need them for them to be mixed with a source of energy. So follow the classical elements if you are looking for life. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. I, I like that you, you know you, you tie this back this idea of of habitat suitability indices um, and this issue that you know some you know for instance planetary scientists and astrophysicists weren't reading old ecology papers or aware of what's going on in ecology. It's one reason I love astrobiology so much is that we're kind of we're kind of breaking that structure of putting every science into its sub sub discipline where people don't talk to each other and it kind of fixes that by forcing us. To think about what other people in different disciplines are doing. Um, before we move on, I do want to mention one of the polls that we had through the NASA Astrobiology Twitter account, uh, at NASA Astrobio. We asked all of the followers of the NASA Astrobiology account just about how many of these exoplanets have we actually detected so far. Uh, we had four potential answers, either 251, 3,728, 4,521 or 10,502. And the majority got the answer right at 4,521. Personally, I didn't have that number memorized. I just have a rough idea of where it is right now because I feel like every time I memorize a number for how many confirmed exoplanets we have, that number changes, you know, days or weeks or months later. And it's just, there's no point in, you know, continually memorizing. But, um, but we had a whole lot of votes, uh, 56.8% of those who voted at 183 votes got it right. 
Um, that's a lot of worlds out there. And, and based on that sole number alone, in a very close place to us, we, we found exoplanets very close to our own solar system, and then a bunch more kind of close to the center of the galaxy. But we really haven't found any yet uh, confirmed anywhere outside of that in the galaxy. But just based on the math, that means there's a lot of worlds out there. Um, you know, it could be 400 billion, 800 billion, maybe a trillion worlds out there. We really don't know, but we have a good estimate now that maybe there's at least 1.6 worlds per star, if not more. Um, and so how many of those are habitable is a big question. And so when I, when I was first mentioned I was going to have you on the show, uh, a young graduate student reached out to me and said that they've actually been using your, your habitability uh, exoplanet uh, habitability catalog for some time now. And I wonder if you could tell our audience then about you know, how you've developed the catalog and how these factors you mentioned earlier kind of build into this idea of, of how we're now taking our idea of what could mean habitability and how we're actually now classifying potentially habitable worlds out there. Well, uh, we have the habitable exoplanet catalog. It's an online database of potentially habitable worlds discoveries for scientists, educators, and general public. It just started by accident. Uh, I just wanted to keep track of the new discoveries and decided why not put that everything online and using a little bit of art because I used to draw. So now I have a, another uh, reason, <laughs> another excuse to, <laughs> to draw some nice images of a representation of exoplanets just for, for visualization purposes only. So we started with that catalog in 2011. So this uh, December uh, f uh, 5th, we celebrate 10 years with the catalog. The catalog identifies, classifies, and compares exoplanets of interest for the search for life in the universe. Latest of date lists up to 60 potentially habitable worlds, but only out of those, 24 of those uh, are what we call the conservative samples, are more likely to have habitable conditions based on their science and insulation. So I have to stress out that even that we have these nice images and views in our uh, catalog page, they are just artistic representation. The only correct thing of those images is about their size, and there's uncertainty. <laughs> and that we know that they have the right orbit to be considered uh, potentially habitable, which is, we call the habitable zone, uh, or the stellar, more properly, the stellar habitable zone. So they are more likely to have uh, good temperatures, given if they have an atmosphere, just to have a liquid water, water at the surface. So uh, from all these objects, they could be right, they could be wrong. They could be oceans were there, they could be uh, dry lands, Words without atmosphere, without water, or even um, else, even planets that are too big, based on our the certainty that are probably more like mini Neptune. We don't know. We have this sample there, and what we need to do is explore each of each one as good as possible. Probably the most interesting planet are those around Trappist One because it has three or even four planets in the habitable zone and are close enough to air for further characterization for the future telescope. So that's one big problem that many of those planets are too far and we won't know anything other or more mm -hmm. in the future. But a few of those are close enough that, that we will go the next step, learning about their atmosphere, eventually something about their surface properties, and uh, in between, probably, if they are really habitable or not. Mm. Yeah, and that's so my, myself and some others have argued before that the word habitable zone itself is, is potentially presumptive and misleading um, because we don't know, as you mentioned, what those worlds are actually like inside of that zone just based on its orbital position alone. And so I, I'm wondering if I can ask you this question, um, what happens if we find out that there is life in Europa's ocean and Enceladus' ocean, and maybe we discover signs of life from a Titanian ocean at the surface with Dragonfly. What if we discover that life is potentially more common on icy ocean worlds? Does that mean we've been looking in the wrong place? Or are we still very justified in looking in this realm of the Goldilocks zone for liquid water because of what we currently know? Okay. Oh, well, I know that the concept of the habitable zone is confusing. But we should state that there are two concepts here. 
if you're using the word the habitable zone as a, a general st uh, uh, statement or word or expression or as a proper name. And here, when we call the, the habitable zone using astronomy, it's used as a proper name. You can call it better, the stellar potentially habitable zone. And it's a particular zone and, and relating that to what ecologists do regarding habitability. This totally makes sense because when you evaluate habitability, you evaluate a certain environment under certain conditions, under certain variables. So these particular stellar habitable zones are for Earth-like planets, surface or liquid water, and then surface life. But the fact is there is a library of habitable zones. You can consider planetary habitable zones. You can consider stellar habitable zones around stars like this one and the classical habitable zone, or even galactic habitable zones. And if you are considering planetary habitable zones, you can uh, uh, decide, and this is something that we learn from ecologists, once you want to evaluate the habitability of a system, you have to decide the space that you are considering and the time frame that you're considering. And the space here could be just surface, or could be subsurface, or could be that subsurface including oceans. And then uh, you will create a library. So eventually we will create something like the book, the habitable zones, and then a library of different considerations and including those in the surface and the oceans and like in the, in the solar system, as you mentioned, and like Europa and Encelados mm -hmm. and, and even the Titan surface and the, and the life as we don't know it. So though, those are different habitable zones. It will be amazing. Yeah. The only thing that and that, I and that, that kind of you. That, that brings up a really good point too. Mm -hmm. that, that brings up a good, a good point. Uh, uh, you recently announced this new Planet Hab collaboration, where yourself and, and a rather large group of researchers are going to work together to kind of um, help us define and develop these metrics of what makes something habitable. Um, I wonder if you can speak to, to the current work uh, for the Planet Hab collaboration and how you envision the future moving forward with that with that team. I think this is a re-emerging field. <laughs> So right now, ecologists have been doing that from forever, <laughs> since the 70s. Now we are starting to apply this model to astrobiology. So it is applica different application and extension of these ideas. So that's why we have a large collaboration of over 30 scientists from different disciplines, from astronomy to biology and ecology, <laughs> very important, uh, that uh, we are trying to get together all these ideas and creating a, a different models. So the idea now is that now that we have this uh, 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 white paper guiding on how it works, then we will address a specific environments. We are working with people uh, uh, re-evaluating the habitability of the surface of Mars. And not to say that Mars is habitable, but we can say how bad it is also. So you think that this model is just to the idea to tell just how is this habitable or not, that's an oversimplification. Once you compare in environment, you, want, you really want to know which ones are worse or good or bad. In the case of Mars, we can have a, a scale of how, how bad it is and then move for, me, deeper to the surface to other better environments. So that's the idea. And the other people working with the oceans in Europa and then the, each, each uh, environment requires different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm really glad you have this collaboration now. And so I'm looking forward to the work coming out of that. Uh, I know I read that you have a session at AppSciCon 2022 that I'm sure our audience will look forward to uh, participating in or coming to watch if they're registered. Uh, I want to switch the conversation just a little bit in the time that you and I have left before I open it up to audience questions. Uh, our audience right now can ask their questions on the Facebook chat or on the YouTube chat, and we will do our best to get those questions over so that we can ask them of Professor Mendez. Um, we did have one other NASA AstroBio poll on the Twitter, uh, at, at NASA AstroBio. We asked everyone, when was the very first exoplanets detected? When, when were the first exoplanets detected uh, using Arecibo, by the way? Uh, and we had a few answers in there. The two that had the most were 1992 and 1995. So we had some people argue it was 95. And yes, that was when we found 51 Pegasi b, the first exoplanet around a main sequence star. 
But actually, the very first detections that we know of came in 1992. Uh, finding exoplanets around pulsars was the, the very first time we found exoplanets out there. And now we have over 4,500. And Arecibo was part of that history of these detections of exoplanets out there. Uh, Arecibo had its construction completed in 1963. Many of us who are nerds for things like this, we know that Arecibo was featured in films like The Amazing Contact, uh, as well as in Golden Eye and several other movies. Uh, we've seen pictures of Arecibo, you know, from the time we were children thinking about this telescope and, and how important it was. And I think many of you uh, hopefully are also aware that we lost the main telescope at the Arecibo Observatory uh, last year. Uh, the main uh, uh, telescope collapsed and took out the dish. Uh, and this was kind of, you know, in s some ways, a long time coming too. There was a major hurricane in Puerto Rico in 2017, Hurricane Maria. Uh, it caused a large number of fatalities, a very large amount of damage to property. Um, it was a devastating hurricane for the island. And it also damaged Arecibo. And with that, with a lack of funding to support upgrading the telescope, maintaining it, uh, we led to this collapse. Uh, and so, Professor Mendez, you've used Arecibo for observations. Um, you know, you're a professor um, nearby um, to, to the observatory. I'm wondering if you could tell us, you know, about what this really meant to young people in Puerto Rico and, and you know, really what led to this devastation of losing this telescope. That was very hard for everybody here in Puerto Rico. Arecibo is iconic, not only in the world, but also uh, for Puerto Rico. We are very proud of our observatory. But uh, we are trying to move forward. And uh, I, as I said, I stood the possibility of light as, uh, elsewhere in the theoretical framework, but uh, we also use the Arecibo Observatory to study stars with potentially no uh, the non-potentially habitable uh, planets. We want to understand the impact of radiation environment stars on their planet, because some stars are very stable, like our sun, but other stars, like, like red dwarf stars, are very active, constantly emitting extra doses of radiation, which could degrade the atmosphere of planets, even make them not suitable for life. I have been monitoring from the Arecibo Observatory some of these after stars for the uh, last four, four years, so I used the observatory before Maria, and I noticed the after the hurricane how uh, the shaking of the structure made the observations a little bit sense less bit sensitive. It was totally usable, yet, but I noticed uh, the difference. And uh, then uh, a little bit of history about this in August 10th, uh, 2020, the auxiliary cable supporting the receiver platform, platform broke, causing a, a 100 feet a long gash on the reflector dish. I used the observatory just one week before that, and I was planning to involve more students. I used to train students there for using the observatory, and uh, I was planning to train more And that semester, and that is starting in August, we had the issue. Then on November 6th, a sale con, uh 2020, a safe co cable broke, this time involving one of the four long main support cables, causing additional damage. And finally, in the early morning of December 1st, uh, 2020, the main platform with all the telescope receiver collapsed, destroying the telescope. Today, the observatory keeps working using other less known instruments. So we only lost the big famous telescope but the Arecibo Observatory is still working there. The buildings, the people, everybody's there. They are working toward replacing or upgrading his famous telescope sometime in the future. That's fantastic. And no, I, I, I had never honestly visited Arecibo, unfortunately. I've never been there, but I've heard from a lot of friends. And, and you mentioned when you kind of first started in astrobiology, there weren't anyone, there wasn't anyone else from Puerto Rico. And, and now we have several Puerto Rican scientists in astrobiology and, and planetary science. And, you know, you have to wonder, was, was the Arecibo Observatory part of what inspired them? I've heard from many uh, folks from Puerto Rico that, that having Arecibo was not only iconic, but really inspired them to feel like part of what we're doing right now in exploring the cosmos and, and better understanding the future. I'll also say that one thing that I learned, and I'm sure many others did, was the phrase, uh, I, I, I might pronounce this wrong, is it, is it WEPA? WEPA. 
<laughs> Wepa, Wepa. Um, so I, I just so I saw this phrase over and over again on Twitter. I had to look it up to find out what this phrase was that was being used over and over again. Um, yeah. And I saw like a lot of camaraderie and support from the community from from Puerto Rico for Arecibo and for the potential future to support a potential future uh, for the telescope for the observatory. I'm very glad you mentioned that the observatory is still functioning. And there is a plan, a potential plan for a future of a larger uh, telescope at the observatory. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about what that looks like right now. Um, we're, we're getting close to one year after the collapse. Um, how do you envision the future of Arecibo? Yes, uh, scientists there and all the scientists around the world, the, the uh, uh, community of Arecibo users are working toward the future of observatory. They are planning things in the short term and the long term. For the short term, probably next year or so, other instruments, smaller instruments located throughout the uh, Arecibo Observatory uh, campus. But uh, eventually, there are two possible options. Uh, the observatory could be fixed. Uh, the main dish, 70% of the, 75% of the main dish is still working, so, and that's easy to repair. So what collapsed was the main receivers that was hanging with, by, with three towers. And that was the most expensive part. But there are other ways to fix that. If you put the receivers instead of hanging at the top, at the bottom, and then hanging a secondary reflector, like, like a Cassegrain telescope. <laughs> so that's one alternative to fix the telescope. But that, if that happens, it will take five or 10 years. But there are other options. To build a totally new telescope, a, the next generation Arecibo telescope or ringet. And this is one idea that uh, we are proposing with the Arecibo community of scientists is that uh, building a face array telescope. So it will totally look different. It will be instead of one single dish, will be thousands of, or sm of smaller dishes working together and uh, in a phase array mode. And that means that you can do, uh, you will have a more sensitive telescope and uh, it, will, it will be able to, without moving that much to observe different videos on the sky, even so it will be put in a platform that is movable. So you will have a longer region of the sky that you will be observing. And you will be observing uh, places never seen before by any big radio telescope because each big radio telescope like the one in, in China fast have limited capability of the sky that uh, uh, that you, you can do. So put that, uh, mm -hmm. Next generation telescope probably is something for 10 or, or, or 15 year frames. So the community is working to uh, writing proposals in between and uh, writing proposals for the big future. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are hopeful for that future and to see what that looks like. I know there's a lot of people out there who are curious to see how they can be involved in supporting the telescope and the future of the observatory. Um, I, I do. I realize we're, we're kind of running over on time from you, know, you and I discussing things, and I do want to only open it up to the audience questions here as soon as I can. Um, I have one more question though of my own first. Um, you know, so you know, with looking at potentially habitable exoplanets out there, we have some really incredible telescopes coming up soon: the James Webb Space Telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. Uh, we'll hear soon from the Planetary Decadal about what might happen soon with maybe Lavoie or Habex or one of these other options for a next generation large telescope. There's definitely a lot of things coming, coming in the near future and in the next few decades for us to observe exoplanets, to look at their atmospheres, maybe one day in the not too, too distant future, maybe even understanding a bit of their surface processes, what their surfaces look like. Um, I'm wondering, so say, say you were, weren't limited by funding, you could build any telescope you wanted to, to look at anything you wanted to. What telescope would you build and what would you look at? That's fascinating. The last decade, we have been collecting plants or places to look. Now we have the places to look. And now in this decade, we will try to get some idea of their atmosphere, if any. Then eventually, 
properties about the surface and and uh, and, and and life. I think the big net thing to do will be an array of telescopes in space. And this array will not only you can build start by building an array of telescopes of on Earth, but then it will be to have many telescopes in orbit, including ones in the orbit opposite to, to Earth orbiting our sun. So you will have a constant instantaneous baseline for interferometry and uh, also uh, an increase your not only your sensitivity if you have many telescopes, but also because of the distance uh, to the spatial resolution of telescope. So I think that will be the big net thing. So not just one telescope, many telescopes working together in a space. Awesome. I look forward to it. The Mendez telescope um, <laughs> when it's in space. I look forward to seeing that happen. Um, we can go to the audience Q&A now, though. We do have a bunch of questions that the audience has been asking through Twitter and through Facebook and through YouTube. Uh, and so I'll start off with a question from Raul Magana, um, user at Raul Magana 2 on Twitter. Uh, Raul wonders if the successes of life as we know it here on Earth um, implies that we will likely find life as we know it elsewhere. Um, I, I guess, you know, since we have living things here right now, does that mean we should expect that aliens look just like us, basically? Well, okay. Uh, when I started in this field, I was drawn to this field because looking life elsewhere. So that was the important thing. Life elsewhere is, 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 is the thing to go for it. And that's probably the easiest solution because, uh, we have stars here, the sun, you see stars everywhere. You have we have planets here, you see now planets <laughs> everywhere. So why not life here, life everywhere? So that's the simple solution. But once you study astrobiology, and I mean all the details of this, you go into the physics, chemistry, and biology of life, you start to get doubts because. <laughs> you see how difficult it is for all the conditions to come right, not only of life, also but of the planet. Life might be easy to start, but the planet to keep that life for long enough or something uh, uh, more complex to happen. So there are many factors that could go wrong. So now I am surprised that uh, uh, we are here more than everything. And now I don't think, and I'm just not interested in looking on life elsewhere. I also, uh, the idea of not finding life is important. And uh, it will be, for example, amazing that if you look at uh, habitable environments, because all habitable environments, having liquid water on earth, have life, is that true elsewhere? We actually haven't looked at a habitable place and for example, if we look at running water on Mars, we see on the deep surface, we find running water. And by all the standards, if we put terrestrial life there, it will survive. And then we don't see any life at all. That will be more amazing. What went wrong? Are we so special? So the big answer is right there on Mars and it's not finding life is bigger answer than finding life. So it is, it's important to look for life uh, of any way possible. It's also good to consider other uh, life as we don't know it. But the problem is that life as we know it use most of the most abundant elements on life, for life in the universe. So if you are considering life as you don't know it, it will have to compete anyway from one life that we know it works that use those elements. So it will be an advantage. So probably that's why in Titan uh, conditions, which are very different, the uh, moon of, of Saturn, the conditions are very different for our life. So maybe there is a different process. But I can tell you because it has a very low energy available because of the low temperatures. Then evolution there, everything will go slower and will be probably, if any life, it will be less concentrated, less dense as compared to any terrestrial life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's still so much to explore. 
Um, and with our explorations, we have another question from at Moo Hoodles on YouTube. Uh, she has two questions. One is whether or not there are any teams planning on using JWST to check out any of these planets further. And, and I can answer that. Yes, there's a bunch of observational astronomers and planetary scientists who are have been very excited for quite some time for JWST for the purpose that it will give us very good resolution uh, at looking at some of these atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, we've had a lot of folks on the show previously who have done observational astrophysics or, or know those who do it, uh, who plan to use JWST just for that. Uh, but Professor Mendez, for you, uh, Muhoodles wants to know um, how new data from JWST might impact the catalog. Oh, okay, that's great. So right now we have objects of interest, and uh, of those twenty-four uh, better objects, we don't have any idea of their atmosphere or surface properties. So if any of the observations of James Webb uh, tells us something about atmosphere, definitely we would highlight those objects. <laughs> but probably at the beginning will be only uh, things about the characterization of the atmosphere. So what ingredients, are, what molecules are there, not necessarily life. That was an important point. But then uh, eventually we might be detecting uh, some biosignatures some compounds in the atmosphere that tells that probably a biological process is going on. So that will be highlight those planets. I will, we, will, we will put that in the web page flashing or something like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> because for, for, for instance, now we are moving from just uh, objects to something more real for, for uh, understanding what's out there. Awesome. Um, and I mentioned when we first started the show that you are very well known on Twitter for all of the cool news you share, not just about things like JWST and, and the catalog, but also um, just for all the, the science and astrobiology you share. Uh, so my friend Joey Pastersky, who is at Joey Pastersky on Twitter, uh, he also with me co-leads the, the Early Career Council of the Network for Life Detection. Um, Joey wants to, wants to know, since you do such a great job of communicating and sharing lots of science on social media, uh, how do you balance having such an active social media presence with your research and teaching responsibilities? Um, and he rephrased it and basically said, how do you not get sucked into Twitter? <laughs> That's a great question, and I have the secret for that. <laughs> okay, okay, let's say that uh, Twitter for me is part of the job, and that's my only social media. I don't use Facebook or anything else. And uh, what I like is to read most of my information because I didn't have a, a specific course about uh, biophysics or, or astronomy and planetary science. I have to get that from myself and study it with books. And I lead, read a lot. And uh, so Twitter for me is what you are actually seeing my post is what I'm reading. So what I have a a a a a news uh, 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 a program that get keywords from the internet and from Twitter, from, from everywhere else, for topics I liked. And when I like a topic or i reading a topic, I just share it. I just share it for everybody else, especially my students. So they're, they're, they're for reverence. So it, it, has, it, has, it is important for us to have that reference. Sometimes I remember... I, I, what was the article that I was reading? I know I, I shared it by Twitter, so I do go, just go in my timeline. So it's an instrument of my work now, just to keep track of the signs I like and uh, and uh, what I am reading, and also to share with, with my students and to the general public. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate following you on Twitter. Um, I get a lot of things to read. I find articles to read because of you, so I, I really appreciate your work there. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Andrew Planet on Facebook, um, and Andrew basically wants to know, um, you know, we found some exoplanets early on um, with more indirect methods. Um, have we gone back with our more evolving technology to look at these worlds? Um, maybe, for instance, you could speak to, are we going back now to try to image some of these exoplanets that we found around other stars using, using things like transit and, and the radial methods and stuff like that? 
Well, uh, imagine a, a one of these planets will be something very hard. It will be something for the future, maybe in one more decade or two decades. Uh, constructing a telescope that will have some occulter of the star because uh, the stars are very bright. And then this uh, potentially habitable planet has orbit so, so close and uh, they are outshined by, by the star. So you need to have a different instrument right now to do that. So we are in this decade at least using transit characterizing the atmosphere of this planet. Then there are a series of instruments or concept instruments that are planned for the future, which have a occulter. So you can see actually the individual light of the of the uh, of the planet. Once you do that, you can do a spectroscopy and see again the atmosphere of the planet. But you can also learn about properties of the of the surface also, because as the planet rotates, if it has oceans and it has land, oceans are much darker than land, and you will see you will still see the planet as a dot of light, but you will see brightening because of the land reflection, darkening because of the ocean, and it will be a large transition. And um, then you can tell through time, hey, this planet has land and oceans. And that's that will be something amazing. If it's, the planet is covered by clouds everywhere, you, you won't be able to tell anything. Is this a desert planet or is this an ocean planet? You won't tell it. But the ones that we would love to see, then we have this possibility also to learn something about their, their surface long before we can have a, a actual closer in picture of this planet. Awesome. Yeah. It makes me think right now, there, there could be someone watching this show right now, perhaps a young person who's interested in astrobiology and planetary science, who might help us make those very first detections of seeing the ocean versus the land and, and helping us study more about these worlds. And, and that takes me to the next question from Ablin Bradford on YouTube. Uh, Ablin has said that she uses Winogradsky columns in teaching to introduce stu uh, students to the concept of the microbiome. Um, and she wants to know, are there any tools that you might recommend that can help the students to understand your work? Oh, uh, I think I use before a lot the analogy that I uh, talk about, about the classical elements. Because, uh, for example, when I say people, students relate that easy because of, of the TV with air, water, earth, <laughs> and fire. And uh, they know those concepts. And uh, I was amazed that uh, once the students learned that and we show them examples, let's say, for example, a rainforest. Why a rainforest is that habitable? Because it has these four elements on abundance. But what about a desert? So there's a limiting factor of liquid water. And what about the deep ocean? The deep ocean, it looks like, like a desert of light and there's a plenty of water there. And you see that there's limited of uh, oxygen there, gases are uh, less dissolved that are that depth, mm -hmm. and there's uh, also less energy. So once they got that, when I just uh, presented, okay, let's uh, estimate and talk about the habitability of the oceans in Europa and say, okay, what will happen? And then look, okay, let me see about gas. Okay, no atmosphere. Okay, we have something wrong here. And then about the energy, well, chemical energy, sunlight, there is a, that, that's below a deep layer of ice. And then realize that that's worse than any ocean here on Earth. And in those conditions, you only have microbial life. And, and this is worse. And we have life here. So the, I asked them, do you think that you will, fishes will be, be able to live there? They say, no, <laughs> no, they realize that. And I have seen scientists postulating about maybe they are fishes or something. Well, with that simple analogy, you can go that far. And I use that analogy because also in the concept of habitability, uh, in a more uh, quantitative way, uh, you use that information just to put numbers to to your problem. So I think that's a, that's a powerful analogy for 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 starting as a, as a habitability assessment for kids. 
Awesome. Yeah, that and an analogy is so important for making things relative to our own understanding, especially for children. Um, I might add for, for Ablin and for any educators who are watching, uh, if you go to, uh, to, to astrobiology.nasa.gov, uh, the website of the NASA Astrobiology Program, uh, there's a page called Education where we have a whole bunch of resources on education, including lots of really cool analogies, uh, learning materials, links to other programs, and how to teach astrobiology including things like planetary astrobiology and exoplanets. Our next question for you, uh, Professor Mendez, comes from Carson, who goes by at the Fermi Paradox on Twitter. Uh, Carson wants to know, what do you think is the most interesting problem in planetary astrobiology? Well, I think that the most interesting problem is to find out if all habitable places are supposed to have life. I think that's the big question. It's not f the interest of finding life alone. So, so saying that a mission is uh, looking for finding life, if it doesn't find life, then the, or we can say the mission was not successful. No, no, no. That's not a good approach. It's just missions should look to determine if all habitable places can sustain life or not. I think that's a more important question. So far, we know that not all environments can support life. We see the moon, we see the Mars, we see that. Now that question is answered. Not all environments uh, support life. It's not that easy. But then that those that we know that are habitable by our standards, are they able to support life elsewhere? That's, I think that's the big question. Um, uh, and I say before, if we find that uh, some or, or those don't, it's telling that life is uh, in the universe is not that common as we believe. Maybe it's hard for the origin of life and then for, for or maintaining life. So there, those two problems there, I think that's the big problem. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have a couple of questions coming in. I know we're starting to run down time a little bit. Um, I have just a few more. Um, two questions came in that are very rel relevant to our discussion of the Arecibo telescope. Um, the first one, um, I'm not sure at what level you'd like to speak to this. Uh, Tom Caruso, who's watching on Facebook, has asked if you can discuss um, some of the radio observations from Arecibo. Uh, specifically, Tom wants to know about the discovery of water in craters on Mercury. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, Arecibo has actually had a lot of discoveries. I wonder if you could just speak to the use of radio observatories for looking at things like water and craters and even more. Yeah, the observatory, as you said, has been used for many different things. One thing that I want to point out is that uh, the difference of the Arecibo Observatory was that it was also able to receive signals like every radio telescope is a receiver, but also transmit signals. And once you transmit signals, you can use a radar mode and transmit the signal and bounce back. And uh, when that, uh, in that mode, you can learn a lot more about the universe. As long as the, what you are looking is close enough for that transmission to go back. <laughs> and uh, so in the radar mode, when you say that radio light to the surface, and then interact with the surface, it comes back with different information. It's like uh, you turn a white light to a surface and it's a dark surface. Okay, it's that surface is dark or different colors. And if you analyze in terms of a spectroscopy, what different elements absorb different type of light, then when you return light, you radio light in this case, to, can tell you uh, different properties of the surface. So that's why the Arecibo has been used to also see not only Moon, but also in Mercury, and uh, at least looking for uh, that uh, water. I had, yeah, wonderful. Now that I, I, I mentioned know Arecibo had like the first maps of the surface of Venus. Um, there, there's lots of things we've done in radar mode. A lot of folks, they, they think of like the Magellan radar maps of Venus, but uh, we actually had Arecibo radar maps of Venus as well. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot in the past with the uh, Arecibo Observatory. Um, our next question from Facebook comes from Martin Hajovsky. Uh, Martin actually wants to know if, uh, if you can speak to the value or, or if, if there is some value to pairing the resolution of a next generation Arecibo uh, with something like a proposed lunar-based radio telescope. 
uh, and I'd even offer, you know, any other telescopes, is there a way for us to pair some of these great telescopes together? Um, definitely. Okay. We need to construct more big radio telescopes around the world. Right now we have a uh, uh, fast in China. It's looking, it's, it has a limited field of view. And then uh, uh, imagine that we are looking at something interesting happen in one location in the sky and Earth moves and then you miss part of that uh, observation because you don't have any telescope on the other side as sensitive as the one or close to sensitive as the one in China. So there are many research projects and scientists trying to do research in the radio spectrum and we need more instruments everywhere. Every, everywhere. And definitely an instrument on the moon will be something amazing because on Earth, and I can attest to this, uh, you have the problem of uh, radio interference and uh, it kills you many observations. For example, we were doing observations in one particular frequency and we had the problem of uh, airplanes radar. Airplane radar trashed about 50% of our observations. And the radar was far away in the airport here in Puerto Rico, far away from the observatory. But the Arecibo was so sensitive that it was picking that. And it was random. It was something not expected because of the so many airplanes. They turn off and off this, this uh, uh, radar for, for landing. And uh, so we have the, that issue. Not having that on the moon because it's in the far side, blocked by, uh, blocking <laughs> by all terrestrial communication. That will be a silent noise, and anything will be something astronomical, and that will be great. But still, it will look at one particular direction, and you have many telescopes everywhere. It will be good, not only in the moon, even in space. Different radio telescope, not that big, probably because in the moon you will have, could uh, build something big, uh, taking advantage of the crater. The problem is that it will be much more expensive than anything on Earth. And uh, for if you are trying first, do many around Earth, big ones, because are less expensive than the moon, then in space, smaller ones, and then you will have all the bases covered. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then one day you'll have a telescope the size of the entire solar system with a giant interferometer, right? That's what, that's what some of us nerd out about is the potential for, you know, a couple of centuries maybe from now of having solar system sized observatory. Um, Professor Abel Mendez, it's been so great having you on the show. I really appreciate you joining us and sharing about your history, your research about Arecibo, uh, its past and future. Um, are there any any messages you'd like to share with our audience, young, old, and anyone else out there before uh, we complete this show? Oh, yes. Uh, I just want to highlight that there is a big cinematography project coming up soon about the receiver Observatory. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, UCD, you will see, you will learn more about the history, what we had done, and what's the future of the observatory. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. Oh, yeah, it's been so great having you with us. Uh, and when that does come out, we will share it through our audience at SaganNet and with the NASA Astrobiology audience as well. Uh, for those watching, if you'd like to do the cool thing and jump on Twitter and follow Professor Mendez, you can do that. Uh, his Twitter handle is at Prof Abel Mendez. Uh, or if you just type his name into the search, he comes up right away. Um, you can also learn more about the Planetary Habitability Laboratory by going to PHL dot upr dot edu uh, and if any of you are interested in following along finding out more about our show as well as about all the incredible things coming through the nasa astrobiology program you can tune in and join sign up right now for the mailing list uh, our producer and director mike toyon is sharing that with you right now how to sign up and follow along with nasa astrobiology uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us and, and until next time keep exploring and stay curious <laughs>